Here we go. Hello, Galaxy fans. I hope you're all having a good one. Hope you all enjoyed the weekend. My name is Mike Gray. I cover both the Galaxy and LAOC for the Striker. Here with me to my left is the man, the main man, my co-host, Alex Reese. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, Mike. Pretty good. Uh, last game was definitely something. Way. <laughs> but, I mean... You know, a draw is a draw, and getting a point in Colorado when you haven't won there in like a year, since 2017 to be exact. I mean, not the greatest victory, but I'll take it as, you know, something positive at least. And again, four games unbeaten, I think that's a good thing, good omen at the moment. I get, ex I get so excited when I see Alex, sometimes I forget to even do his intro. Uh, he's actually the beat writer for the Galaxy, and he does an amazing job. Make sure to su subscribe to the Striker uh alex man uh i i had a weekend <laughs> saturday i was looking forward to uh covering lafc i was going to cover the galaxy i was going to even check in on that u.s game I had my schedules all ready to go uh you don't even know about this dude but uh you know i actually woke up at 5 30 a.m that's how excited it was i go in my garage i hit the thing and and then i'm just like my heart sinks like god damn it like so I tried to open it again, and it got like a foot maybe, and then you could see it just start to angle. And uh, yeah, my, my garage door was broken. And uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, Mike Gray has had a bit of a problem with transportation lately. Uh, first I had to sell a car, and that meant getting another car on the road. And then I kind of like broke my leg, which I didn't, but I kind of did. And then uh, now my garage door doesn't work. So that was like, you know, I was so furious about it. I didn't even post online. <laughs> I was just like, dude, just uh, whatever. But all right. But yeah, man, um, partly what I like about doing this show and just covering the team is I can get away when life is a bit of a pain in the ass. So um, yeah, let's get to it, man. We've got, uh, we've got more than a few shout outs, first of all. Uh, there's a lot going on in the Galaxy community. There's, there's a few people we got to pray. So let's get right to it, man. First of all, the U-17s, uh, let's give them a lot of credit. Uh, they actually came away with the MLS Next Cup Championship uh, over the weekend. They defeated Real Colorado 4-2. Uh, Julian Placias recorded a brace. Uh, look out for that dude. Well, Harbor Miller and Ruben Ramos Jr. both scored goals. Uh, and then, you know, what was also cool is uh, you had the Angel City Brigade, you had Galaxy Outlaws, you had a bunch of supporters actually meet them at the airport, which is pretty cool. Um, shout out to everyone who showed up. You know, it's important that we do community and, uh, you know, we show up for everyone, not just like the first team. So, you know, appreciate it. Um, next yeah, that up, was uh, definitely exciting, uh, you know, to see them uh, win this tournament. I think it was good. I think Greg Vanny's, you know, worked a lot and definitely emphasized on boosting the academy. And again, we know that this region here in Southern California is super rich when it comes to soccer talent. I mean, you know, we've seen a couple of players already young players like Julian Araujo, like uh, Jalen Neal now, right, that were coming up through this Galaxy U system in a way. I mean, not maybe not Julian exactly, but, you know, he was a guy that they helped cultivate and helped grow. Uh, Jalen, right, coming from the academy since he was 13, since he was really young, and then oh, building his way all the way we'll up here. And, later, yeah, I mean, look at that guy. Uh, but like I'm saying, you know, I think it's good to see that, you know, L.A. Uh, is getting, seeing the fruits of what they're doing. In the academy, I think it's great, and again, we really, I think, for, as a club-wise, they really want to cultivate that environment and showing that this can be a successful academy and that you can have a pathway to the first team and get minutes that way. So I think that this is great uh, for everyone involved, and congrats, congratulations to that team. I'm sure they had a lot of fun. It was definitely a fun game. I watched a bit of it before I had to leave to do some other stuff, but I was, I was definitely impressed, and I think uh, we're going to start to see uh, the Galaxy maybe be a team that's maybe talked among teams that have youth side because again like i said this region uh, of the country is rich in soccer town and i think the galaxy need to capitalize on that 
Yeah, and uh, you know, I think that was good of you to give uh, Vanny a shout out because at the beginning of the year, that, that dude was stretched. He was trying to run the team. He was trying to do transfers. He was trying to be a sporting director. He, he actually joked to us at one point about how he maybe deserved a second parking spot because all the different roles he was doing. And he did specifically mention that he was just sort of checking out the academy and just trying to make sure you know everything was connected. And he, he deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, speaking of a lot of credit, uh, the blue, white, and gold pop-up is returning. That's going to be August 13th. Uh, it's moving. It's not going to be at the Graph Lab. Uh, it's going to be at the Absolute uh, Absolution Brewing Company in Torrance. Uh, dude, they do such amazing stuff. I mean, uh, you can actually see players a lot, uh, you know, on social media, uh, you know, showing off their stuff. I mean, I'll tell you this much. Uh, you know, Jamie, uh, Jamie Fam, he's he's one of the dudes who runs One Two Threads. He's a really good dude. Um, I have had a few occasions over the years where I like something and I'll just kind of ask him if he'll, he'll hook it up. Uh, in this case, I was broke. I didn't have money at the time. But, like, um, I tell you what, Alex, this is what happens a lot with one, two thirds. They come up with something that's cool, and then you've got maybe a few days, a week, two weeks tops, and then they're going to sell out. What do you think? You know, so anyway, they sent me this tie dye shirt a few weeks ago. Uh, I wore it on the show. It was cool. And, uh, you know, the other day I popped up because I had a friend who wanted one. I was like, all right, let's see if they got a medium. Nope, sold out. These guys sell good stuff and it sells out quick. So, uh, you know, you get, if, you, if there's something on that site, you get a bike pretty quickly. So um, there's that. And then, uh, get, you know, I was listening to La, uh, the Lacuna Galaxiana podcast uh, with our friend uh, Rob Halon and Ananda. They do such a great job. Uh, shout out to those guys because, I mean, first of all, they gave us a shout out on their pod, so we got to return the favor. Uh, we might be doing something with them a little bit, so stay tuned. And then there was this funny story. Um, I actually saw them at the tailgate. Uh, Ananda, you know, uh, I had a big meal right beforehand, so I was just like, you know, I was just trying to just relax and just hang out. And then I see him and Rob, and then, you know, Ananda, <laughs> he tells me, dude, you got to try this uh, uh, t tortilla España. And I'm like, well, what is that? And he goes, you know, well, in Spain, if you order, you know, a tortilla, you get what's called this, like, potato and egg kind of casserole, like, finger food kind of thing, you know? And then I was like, I was a little worried about it because, you know, I never had it before. I tried it. Dude, it was delicious, man. It was like a, it was, it was like a Lay's potato chip pie or something. But anyway, so um, we get back upstairs and then, you know, halftime comes. And uh, guys, just to fill you in on a secret, Al Alex is a good dude because he saw that I was hungry. He saw that I had half a leg. And so, he, you know, he brought me a cookie. And uh, I thought that was very sweet of him. And then, you know, I only ate one bite of it. And I always felt like a jerk. So... Alex, if you were sad because I didn't eat any of the cookie that you brought me, it's only because Ananda filled me up with his potato and egg casserole. So don't worry, dude. We're still on good terms. Uh, the podcast is still on track. So um, I'm glad you accept my apology. And then, uh, all right, last but not least, uh, dude, that was a scoreless draw. That wasn't the most funnest game of all time. But uh, over on the... FS1, you had Jalen Neal just performing lights out. And, dude, um, I'll tell you this much. You know, I even confessed, confessed to Sarah, a uh, Galaxy mom. You know, I don't hype up Jalen as much as I should. I mean, partly because it's, you know, I don't have to. Everybody already knows how great he is and how consistent he is as a player. But, I mean, ugh, dude. Against uh, you know, against Jamaica, he comes in at halftime, uh, thirty-seven, forty-one passing, four balls into the final third. Uh, he won three out of four ground duels, six recoveries, four clearances, and zero fouls committed. This dude is a human metronome, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I mean again, I, I think we've heard praises about Jay Laniel so often this year. You know, <laughs> Vanny is always praising him. Sometimes, you know, he kind of gets tired of praising him, but, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, interim to the interim coach, uh, BJ Callahan, you know, had some good things to say about Jay Laniel. And, you know, he came in for Aaron Long. And I'm just going to, like, flat out say this. Jay Laniel's better than Aaron Long. I could write a whole article about it. I could talk about it. He's just a way better Agreed. center back. And he provides a lot Agreed. more than Aaron Long does. Obviously, Jay Laniel does have his, you know, moments where uh, he's still young. You know, it still doesn't really have as much experience. Uh, and definitely he's like lacking that physicality part of his game. 
he's not as dominant physically as you know I would expect a center back to be. But I mean, again, he's just nineteen. He's still building in his body. He's still growing, right? You know, I'm still growing. I'm the same age as Jalen Neal. I'm still growing. So <laughs> if he, I'm still growing. He's still growing. So he's he's all good. But again, like you said, right? He's going against Premier League caliber defenders in Mikel Antonio, Leon Bailey, Damari Gray. That front three is probably the best front three at the CONCACAF Gold Cup at this current moment, if we're being honest. And the fact that he's able to go toe-to-toe and not necessarily be a weak, weak link coming in at halftime, and especially when you're trailing and you're sending numbers forward, because at the time, the U.S. was down 1-0. And, you know, Jamaica, they've got pace on the wings with Gray and Bailey. So uh, the U.S. defense did a good job. And, again, I think I'm, we're just proud to see Jalen Neal, I think, get recognized on this national stage in a way. Because, you know, all the major U.S. men's national team accounts are talking to, on Twitter are talking about Jalen Neal. How, you know, he's a great ball-playing center back, and, and he is. Um, and just how much potential that he has to really cement himself and be a guy that's consistently in the conversation of being in college for U.S. men's national team games. And I think that's a great thing to have. Um, obviously, the guys who wish they had him right now, considering their center back crisis, with, you know, Martin Casares being out for 35 months now. Eric Zavaleta as well is with the El Salvador. El Salvador did not look too good today. Um, and again, they have Sergio Kulabali uh, injured, and again, Casares injured as well. So, although, you know, uh, Neil is doing a great job, fantastic job, the guys who definitely wish that they had him right now at this current moment. Yeah, but what are you going to do? Um, at least they were able to keep him uh, for that U-20 tournament. And to be fair, uh, the U.S. did get knocked out pretty early, at least based off of expectations. I, from what, I didn't see the game, but I was told that uh, they were outfoxed against Uruguay. And yet, I believe it was, uh, I didn't catch up on the whole thing. But, you know, I think if they had gotten past that game, they could have they gone all the way. So, you know, uh, would have, could have, you know, he we'll see about that but um yeah moving on to the uh game uh the galaxy obviously had the scoreless draw against the colorado rapids uh partly out of necessity the galaxy put out a 352 formation uh you had three center backs uh kelvin leardown was inserted into the mix along with uh chris mavinga in the middle and then you also had Caligari, not Lucas Caligari, Caligari, because we're doing the Brazilian thing. And then we had, uh, you know, Cuevos on one end uh, playing right. First MLS start? Yes. First, uh, you know, coming off his uh, first MLS appearance, so that was cool. And then you had um, Raheem Edwards on the other side, which I thought was an inspired choice. Um, speaking of Jalen Neal and, you know, his insane consistency, uh, look at Ade. Uh, you know, he's been a positive force when he first arrived, but he, he's also experiencing what 99% of uh, people in their first year in MLS experience where they hit sort of a rookie wall. Uh, I don't know that that wall exists with Jalen, but it definitely did with Ade. And so I like the idea that they st- that he put uh, Edwards in because he had a good performance. And speaking of which, you know, let's uh, I've sort of split it up into pros and cons. Um, what I like about this game is that, again, part, it was partly by necessity, but I like that Vanny, instead of trying to win the game on his terms, uh, he was practical. Uh, he decided to just do the 3-5-2. You had, and as a result... You know, you had the um, <clears throat> you had this utilitarian lineup that was successful, and you know, I, I hate to bring up, I feel like I bring up Bruce Arena a lot, but um, you know, the Galaxy they, they were able to grind out a point, and it's nice to see that. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, Colorado is one of the toughest places to play in Major League Soccer. Again, like I mentioned earlier in the pod, they haven't won there since 2017. And with the current squad and what's going on with the club, you know, having losing two veteran players, you know, morale is going to be a little bit low. So the fact that they're able to kind of grind it out, get a point, is a win in my books. I think that as the name of the game right now is just accumulating points. And although it's just one point, it's better than just staying where you are. At least you're moving little by little, right? I mean, at the end of the day, right, it may not matter, but it could. It could be one point that separates the Galaxy from a playoff spot or not. But, you know, they had chances to win this game at the end. The Galaxy were really getting on the end of counterattacks and... Uh, there, there were moments where there should have been more in the final third, more production in the final third, and obviously that's been plaguing the team all season long. So I, I, as long as they didn't lose this game, that's okay. Yeah, it's the Galaxy a result are... at least, and I think Vanny kind of talked about it. You know, proud of the guys for how they fought, how they were able to kind of you know go for the game at the end. I'm sure, they didn't get the result, but they were going for the game at the end. It's not like they conceded and allowed Colorado to play on their own terms and their own turf, right? The Galaxy, I think, for the last five minutes. Had a lot more of the possession, was the much better team, and should have at least scored one goal. Um, 
to be able to bring Douglas Costa and Tyler Boyd uh, off the bench really help them and get in, you know, they played in this 3-5-2, but eventually they moved back to their traditional 4-3-3 uh, in the second half. So they were really building a ways to kind of, you know, sustain themselves for this game. So I think as long as they were able to get a point, that that's an acceptable result, especially considering the circumstances that the team is dealing with right now and for the foreseeable future because they have a lot of games coming up. Man, this team is so frustrating because you're right. They are unbeaten in four, and you know their one win wins against Real Salt Lake, who I think is criminally underrated at the moment. They could they could be like in third place right now with like just a few bounces of the ball, which is insane. But um, yeah, I mean, what was it? So some something about how they were won like five on the road or something. They just can't seem to win at home, and then the Galaxy beat them three to two. So again, always playing to the level of their competition, which you, by the way, pointed out. Uh, the other positive that I liked is that you had some good individual performances. We both were impressed with Mavinga and how, uh, you know, you said it. Once he gets a little more game time, we're going to start to see this dude perform. And he brought this rugged physicality. He had a few game-changing uh, tackles. Uh, and, he, you know, he helped anchor that three-man back line pretty successfully. Uh, I also thought that Preston Judd... Uh, he was gassed, let's be honest. <laughs> but he also, in his own way, made things happen. And I'm, I'm really starting to, to like the idea that he should have a starting role on this team. Yeah, and going back to moving, I think this was a great game for him. You know, we, I think when he was first initially brought in to the club, we all expected him to be maybe a starter. I mean, he's been a starter for Toronto FC. He was there during Greg Vanny's, you know, days of winning the trouble with Toronto. So he has a lot of experience, and he was at one point regarded among the better central defenders in Major League Soccer, for being honest. So the fact that, you know, he's had to wait a while due to, you know, Neil getting the start over him, you know, injuries have really plagued him and not getting that consistency. And then now getting thrown in back-to-back 90-minute games since recovery, I think that's, you know, something we really have to applaud and give attention to. You know, Greg mentioned uh, post game that this was his first time playing in the middle of uh, back three. And, you know, if you're the center back in the middle of a back three, that's the most demanding and the position where you need to be. Yeah, where you need to be sharp because you're calling decisions, you're making the decisions, you're telling the back line when to push up, when to push down. You're on the ball often. And again, it since you're just since you're in the middle of a back three, your movement and positioning definitely matters at all times when the opponent's on the ball. So Mavinga did an excellent job in this game. And again, he was making some good tackles, great recoveries, um, closing down spaces. So we really have to applaud his performance um, in this game, especially considering he was the only center back available. And, and like you mentioned, Preston Judd, you know, Greg won with Dayan Jovalic and Preston Judd up top. Judd kind of playing a little bit higher up with Jovalic coming deep a little bit uh, under, under uh, Preston. So I thought it was interesting to kind of see that. I Knowing that Greg likes one, star, one striker up top, yeah, I thought it was a bold move for him to do this. We've never seen two strikers work out. Um, but it, I thought, you know, and Joe Bullish didn't necessarily do a great job, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Preston, we had to applaud him for just constantly working, constantly kind of draining the tank during game days. And I think, you know, there's something there with Preston, you know. And it's I wouldn't say, you know, it's like, you know, when I look at him on the ball, he's not the most technical striker. And again, he's a very physical, very much relies on those natural tools. But there's just something in him that like just attracts him to being dangerous in front of goal, in front in the box, in front of the net. So I think there's something that the Galaxy needs to look into more of that. Again, this game against Colorado is always going to be a weird one considering the circumstances uh, that they had to play in a different formation, and you know they were dealing with uh, you know short notice, uh, didn't get a, I think it was three days rest they got. So I, I think we still need to see a larger sample size of Preston Jetta as a lone nine, and I think uh, you know against San Jose uh, this week we, we should see it. Yeah, there's just something, it was like Steven Linhart a little bit. Like, if you get a big dude who you can't knock off the ball, like, that's always going to be a a strength. But, you know, uh, a lot of teams, a lot of people in positions of power, you know, it's not not a sexy position, you know. People uh, are always trying to sort of uh, plan around it. But, you know, if you have the right number nine, you know, uh, you can accomplish a lot. Uh... And, you know, as far as Mavinga goes, uh, I remember when things were at a low point and he had that post on social media and people oh, were yeah. making a big deal out of it. And me and Alex were just like, dude, chill. Just just, just chill. Like, he's, he's fine. Like, like just relax, guys. He's not going to call this coach on the Internet. Like, <laughs> if he, he is, a, then you got a serious problem. But, like, yeah, um, which is um, so an important lesson is always listen to the striker because we're always right. 
so you know just keep that in mind um now uh some of the things i didn't like so much about the game uh first of all i do think that the galaxy again you know they hadn't won since 2017 or whatever like uh it's tough to play in colorado but yet the results is a bit indicative of where this squad is right now i mean colorado have scored the least amount of goals in mls they have uh astonishingly low four points from that they've taken from home games all season four points so well, when you look at the center backs and you go, oh, well, this worked, I'm kind of like, yeah, I guess. But, like, w w what happens when you play tougher competition? And then the other part, and maybe you can talk about this, Alex, uh, Jovalic, another ineffective game from the Serbian. Yeah, I'll start with the Jovalic thing again. You know, we've been talking about, you know, somebody needing to take the reins now with Chicharito gone. And let's remember, he, like, a year ago, he said on national TV, he's the future of Galaxy yes. following the, yes. the win against Atlanta, right? Very um, cocky. And, and again, we, we like that about Jovalic. We like that he's candid, that he in, says his intentions, and, you know, he's a very, uh, you know, he he will achieve, he will look to do as much as he can to achieve what he wants. But he's either that guy now. I, exactly. And and right now, let's be honest, it's a way different dynamic when you're starting than as a super sub. And I think Jovalic talked about it earlier this season where it's just so much easier to get goals in the final 30, 20 minutes of the game. When you're a striker, you have to be a lot more patient. You need to be a lot more smarter in your runs, in reading the game, and reading the attacks. And I'm not saying Jovalich isn't a smart player, but my thing is he's kind of been, in a way, accustomed to coming off the bench, to exposing those spaces, to a team that's a lot less organized, right? If the opponent is chasing the game, they're going to be a lot less organized in the back line. Meanwhile, while you're starting, everybody, you know, just, just got the tactical instructions from the manager just, you know, minutes before kickoff, right? They're going to be a lot more organized. And it's going to be a lot tougher. And again, I'm not saying Jovalic can't score goals when that happens. But I think right now we need to see an evolution in his game. And I think Vanny talked about it when I asked him, you know, why isn't he performing? You know, he mentioned that, you know, it's not just his fault, but also, you know, the team isn't necessarily getting in the best crossing positions for him to expose and those spaces in the box. And again, that's what we saw a lot from uh, him last season where he's making those cutbacks and those runs in the box where he can just shoot it and it goes past the keeper. But also he mentioned for Jovalich that he needs to be able to make those smarter runs, be able to know and read the spaces better and be able to kind of work with the teammates around him a lot better. Because at the end of the day, a striker you know, definitely relies on their teammates, but they're the ones making the decisions on where they need to be positioned, when they shoot, and you know how they help with the build-up play. And I think Jovalich in those three departments has been very subpar this season. Yeah, and there's been an evolution in perception. Uh, you know, we both questioned Vanny at some point about how does he get the best out of Jovalich and how does he make the transition from just having a system to be actual coaching and figuring out how does he make this dude work. And I think that it is fair at this point to question whether or not uh, it's a Vanny thing or whether or not, like, we have both realized, you know, Jovalich had tap-ins. He had worn-out defenders. That's an easier job than starting. Like, I, I, I mean, I know we're, we're saying it's different, but, like, let's just call it what it is. It's a lot easier to come off the bench and score goals than it is to start and score goals. That's the evolution that you were talking about. And until I think we're at the point where it's on Jovalic. I mean, again, last year he was super cocky, but he was also finishing his chances. Last year's Jovalic, I mean, starter or not, I think he finishes that, that chance with um, – Yeah, you know, 36 minutes, right, right in front of the goal. goal. Like 12, 13 yards out, right? Like that yeah. needs a better finish there. And again, you know, there's a whole half of the season left. Um, I think this is the time to prove it, if we're being honest. Uh, is he really the future of the LA Galaxy? Because, you know, sure, he's, you know, not necessarily getting DP money or, you know, he's a player. He's still on the under-22 uh, initiative. Um, but you want to see something from him as a starter. And again, we'll know, you know, I, I think it's likely we'll see Chicharito move on. Um, but I think if he sees, and if the Galaxy see fit that it's time to get another striker, um, I think that means Jovalich's time, or, you know, him, he's going to have to move on if he's going to be a starter. And again, we know he's a young player. He's on the Serbian national team. You know, he's a guy that was just called up, scored twice off the bench. Uh, but you, if we're being honest, uh, Jovalich definitely needs to step up and be that starter, not just for the Galaxy, but just for his career in general. And I think right now you need to see that difference in him being a lot more clinical once he's in the initial 11. And it might, that might be one of the big storylines heading into 2024 20, is, okay, can the Galaxy 
develop Jovalic and get them going enough to the point where they build this new team around them. And yeah, let's um, let's just jump to it because we've only got a few minutes left and I, I kind of want to get to this. Um, the Galaxy have three wins this season. Uh, three wins, nine losses, and six ties in 18 games. The season's already more than halfway over. Um, <clears throat> there's 16 games left for the Galaxy to make some sort of run. Right now, the Galaxy are 10 points out of a playoff spot. They've got very limited means to bring in reinforcements this summer. I mean, um, you know, when I'm looking at the schedule, again, 16 games left. If we're going to be honest, you know, the Galaxy have traditionally had trouble bringing in players and then, you know, bring them in one day and then they, they're on the field the next. Nope, there's usually a waiting period. You have a waiting period. The player needs to get... Sometimes they need to get acclimated. Sometimes they don't. And what all players have to do, and, you know, we were talking about this, uh, Vanny's system seems to take longer to uh, succeed and, to, you know, to get to the point where it's efficient than others. It takes longer for players to get used to Vanny's system than in cases of some other teams. What this all tells me is that I'm not sure the Galaxy can bring in, even in some if they're to wave a magic wand and bring in the right reinforcements, is 16 games enough to integrate these guys? Because, I mean, we're, right now we're, we're kind of at the period where, where Brugman was brought in and then uh, Ricky Pouch played 11 games with the Galaxy. So, you know, I, I don't... I'm sus I'm suspi I have my doubts that they'll be able to bring in reinforcements that will be able to make some sort of difference. And then they also have the toughest strength of the schedule in the West, too. Uh, what that means is <clears throat> they've played opponents with a winning percentage of 46%. For the remainder of their schedule, uh, that percentage jumps up to 52%. Doesn't seem like a big amount, but it's actually uh, the, one, the biggest discrepancy. In, it's the biggest gap in the West. And the fit, that 52 number is the highest percentage in the West. So... They didn't play a bunch of easy teams, and their schedule is about to ramp up. Uh, so, you know, you've got all this negativity, and, um, well, actually, you know what? Let's just, uh, let me look the schedule a little bit more. We've got, again, out of the 16 games, uh, nine home, seven away, so that's basically a wash. Um, after the, the Galaxy go away to San Jose this week, they've got a cluster of about five games. Four of them are home games. One of them is going to be against Real Salt Lake, who, which is going to be two or three days before they compete in their uh, Open Cup semifinal versus Houston. That's going to be a second-string squad. Uh, I, the, they've got the game versus LAFC at the Rose Bowl, which I guess you can kind of say is a, is a wild card, even though for me that's going to be a tough game. But um, they've also gotten a away trip to Vancouver, which uh, Vancouver is on a roll right now, so that's not good either. But... Four home games in five. In, in five. Uh, if they can just get something out of this, maybe. But if this is a situation where they don't get at least like like, like a win, then at, this is you're you're kind of already at the point where it's like, well, if we win five in a row here and these teams slip up down the stretch, you know, at that point, I think it might be too late. Yeah, I think July is an important month if we're being honest, because again, in the context of there being a four game unbeaten run at the moment. That's the best form of Galaxy I've been in all season long. So this month, like you mentioned, Mike, is going to be really tough. You got a lot of tough opponents because, you know, you got San Jose at to end June, then or excuse me, start July, then LAFC at the Rose Bowl just, you know, two, three days later. And then you have Philadelphia Union coming in, and they're, you know, one of the top teams in MLS in the past three years. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to be really tough to see kind of how this team does. Uh, in those situations. But like you mentioned, right, um, I think right now we're kind of in a bit of a transitional period. Uh, you know, Chicharito has been the face of the Galaxy for three, four years at this point. And I think, you know, obviously, unfortunately, him going down and missing the rest of the year, but this feels like the, uh, a roster that's going to change. And then let's look at it. Uh, from Vanny's first season here, G just Chicharito and Sega Kulabali and Jonathan Bond uh, are just like the few faces that come to mind of that original team um, from his first season here. So I think we're going to see a change in who comes in and who comes out. And I think this year, in some way or another, has to be a bit of a transitional year in order to move on from those players. Because, you know, you know, Jonathan Bond has makes great saves, but is he really an elite MLS goalkeeper? Sega Koulibaly, again, you know, struggled to stay fit, and we really haven't seen that good form that he had from last year. 
uh, this year at all. And Chicharito, again, being uh, a player who's 36 now, who's, you know, definitely taking a step back when we've looked at this season. Um, it, it just feels for me that there's this is a transition season. And although it probably wasn't expected to be, especially considering that you kind of have players that are, you know, win now players. Um, I think this year was always meant to be a, a bit of a transition. You have Jalen Neal coming up, Aude, Caligari getting their feet wet. Um, I think you have maybe 10, nine players that have made their debut with the LA, LA Galaxy this season. Mm-hmm. So again, it's just a, it's a weird year, if we're being honest, when you look at it from that perspective. Um, but again, I, I think there's still time. I mean, I'm always going to you know believe that there's hope. Um, if they're able to come away with some spectacular results this month, it's not over yet. But like I said, I think it's a transition year. And from that perspective, if it is and they get results, I think that's a major dip, uh, major win. Correct. Uh, yeah, time, time's running out for this club, at least for this season. But um, it's, you know, things could be worse. Uh, I, I sort of rambled at, at the end of the last podcast, but I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, this is just a weird MLS season in general. Uh I mean, uh, like, if, if ever since the Rose Bowl game got, like, rained out, it has felt like a bit of a cursed year. But, I mean, this was the – you had Apple introducing their deal, and for MLS to sell the package, they had to, like, sell an excessive amount of games. So, the, the, you know, this whole season, in a way, is going to be defined by excess. You have the League's Cup. You have teams all over the league that are already exhausted. Then you have the League's Cup. Then you have uh, Messi coming to MLS, which I mean, like I'll tell you this much, Alex. Last year was last year's MLS season was defined by L- by LAFC's double, like like that was like a normal year, with all the craziness going on, especially with Messi coming to MLS and this weird like, I do not like this playoff format, Alex. I I, I keep thinking that like the Timbers are gonna win MLS Cup or something. Like I just I don't know. Like like it just seems to me that. You might not have the cream rise to the top. I really like the new MLS playoff format because I felt like you finally had it in a position where the team who won the Supporter Shield was being rewarded for be- winning the Supporter Shield. I like that system. The system kind of sucks. I don't like it. And uh, I'm, I, I don't see that this format lasting another few years and then they're like, well, this is amazing. No, they're going to they're gonna change it. And then, you know, we're going to be like, oh, well. So this is if you're going to, like, mess around, this is the year to do it. Uh, so for me, it comes down to like a few important things because again, um, next is so damn vital. You've got two DP slots open, uh, and you've got a lot of question marks. So let's get to it because for me, it's about three things. The first thing is you talk to Ricky Pooch and you find out where his headspace is at. Ricky, we will make you the fran- leader of this franchise. You will be the face of this club. Are you in? Yes or no? If he's in, then Ricky... You know, he knows what's going on, Miami. Ricky, we will support you. We will give you two DPs that are so efficient, so amazing that they're going to make Sergi Busquets and Jordi Alba look like amateurs. In fact, if the Galaxy really want to make Ricky happy, what's, again, knowing what's going on in Miami, they should tell him, hey, if your camp, if you yourself or have players that you want to play with, maybe some other guys, some guy, maybe we can get on a deal. Let us know. If we're willing to bring in players who you think will compliment you and will help you with your game, let's have that conversation. For me, that's the smart thing to do, first of all. The second is no panic buys, obviously. Will Koontz on uh, Corner of the Galaxy made it clear, I think, with the, you know, he kind of, it was kind of a, it was kind of a tell how he was just sort of praising the current team and how, you know, a few bounces and maybe they have different results. Uh, and again, I was talking about Ricky and doing what he's doing. If you have a player who fits the profile, go for it. Uh, with all this uncertainty, uh, I don't think there are many players who are going to fit that. Uh, there are two teams in LA now, so the whole just, you know, we'll see how it goes. And then uh, finally, my third thing, Alex, and then I'll let you kind of like maybe summarize before we take off here. Um, you got to figure out the future of the front office. Uh, and that for me is two things. At worst, a month, by the, at a, you know, you've got like maybe a month following the end of the MLS season. You got to know who your club president is if you want to just have the next season be a normal season and not another transitional year. Get that figured out now. The other important thing is once you get that figured out, and maybe I'll just ask you directly, Alex, do you think that Greg Vanny 
deserves his final opus? Do you think that he deserves a chance to just really just take this team in 100% and just make it his? Because when he arrived, he had Chicharito, and then he, whether you agree with it or not, he's the one who, you know, decided to bring Cabal to the club. And uh, I don't think that he was working with the same deck as uh, some of the other elite teams in the league. And so what do you think? Do you think that Vanny has a future with the club beyond this year? Do you think that he's got something to prove? What, what, what's your intuition, Alex? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because, again, he's not just a coach. He's a sporting director as well. And is he going to give up those duties? Uh, I think that's the real question we have to be asking uh, when it comes to the next season. If he does stay, I think, in my opinion, I think Greg Vanny is a good coach. I think he's a good soccer mind to bring into the organization. Again, he's, you know, had experience kind of building Toronto. And, you know, they just fired Bob Bradley, right? And Greg Vanny is the only successful manager in that club's history. So, I mean, you know, he, he's an outlier in that department. And I think there's there's good in what Greg wants to do and his intentions. Again, we talked about the U-17. He's emphasized wanting to improve that and give that more attention. And, again, the, the fruits have paid off for that labor. So I think, you know, Greg's soccer mind to kind of rebuild the infrastructure of the club because let's be honest when he came in the club was completely different and for the worst reasons in my opinion <laughs> um you know they, they joke yeah and i think you know greg's done some positive things sure the results haven't gone on the field but off the field i mean you can't say that they're improving that they're not improving in that department because they are and i think you know greg has to be given the opportunity to have two tps have a you know season where you can reinforce in the summer and where you can you know kind of set up for you know bringing in the the guys you want during the preseason. I think he deserves that. Sure, they're, you know, the expectation of the other Galaxy to constantly be in, you know, uh, an MLS Cup contending position to be a top team in the West. Sure, they've definitely 100% missed the mark on that this season. But I think if you just give him one more season to do that and kind of build that foundation, I think it'll lead to something. I mean, if you want to get a new coach who's going to probably completely change the play style and, you know, there's, there's a lot of good coaches out there. But again, you're going to be changing a lot. And Greg Vanny is the infrastructure of the club. He is that foundation at this moment. And if you get rid of him, you have to rebuild the house from the first brick once again. And in my opinion, you, the Galaxy should not do that. Yeah, the sporting director thing is weird because he didn't sign up for that position. It was sort of a thrust on, upon him. So in a way... You know, for me, I, in a way, I feel like the questions should be like, like, there's really two questions. One, should he return as head coach? In my opinion, yes. Should he return as sporting director? In my opinion, no. Uh, I, I don't think that Vanny envisioned himself being Bruce Arena. Um, you can't do both jobs, man. Like, there's so, m <laughs> like, like there, this is MLS, and like. It's gotten more and more ambitious, and I mean, Peter Vermees is the other guy who's trying to do that, and you look at what Sporting Kansas City is doing. Like, this is just my opinion, Alex, but I think that it's an outdated role. Uh, teams are too good these days. Teams are too ambitious. Teams have too much money. And as it is, you know, everyone's saying, spend more money, spend more money. Well, the issue is that teams are actually doing a really horrible job of spending the money that they have. There's other leagues, like, for example, the J League, where they're doing a much better job with their finances. So if you ask me, and it, it's this is, irregard, this is regardless of his job. I think that he's done an admirable job, especially trying to do both positions. But it's not what he signed up for. I think that he was thrust in a position, and I don't think that you can have him do all that. I think he needs help. What do you think? Yeah, again, like you mentioned, it's just going to be a matter of time to see what happens, and it'll be up to him uh, at the end of the day if he's going to continue or not. Well, uh, La Cuna Galaxiana, um, 20 minutes behind, but gracias for the shout-out, boys. Great pod. Uh, and then we got another comment. Uh, just got to start Judd as the lone target striker. Yuvalich only subs in 70, 70, 75th minute. Bebo starts if Judd is ever injured. Knock on wood. Yeah, man. I mean, like... One of the beauties of MLS is if you give players chances and you give them reps, they will improve over time. I think that me and Alex are both on the train of let's just give Jed a little bit more time the first time, see if some of that skill rubs off. Yeah, let's just get a big, let's get a bigger sample size of what he can do as the starting nine. That's just my premise on that. Let's do it.
All right, we got to go. Uh, Alex has very important things to do. I have semi-important things to do, but uh, my name is Mike Gray. I cover the, the Galaxy and LSU for the Striker. This is Alex Reese. He is our beat writer, cover for the Galaxy. And you can catch us.